Dobrý den. Dobrý den, já vás vítám na dnešním mezinárodním semináři k tématu sociálního bydlení. Jmenuji se Linda Sokačová a z technických důvodů vás budu dnešním dnem místo paní Vopelákové z armády z Pásy provázet já. Děkuji, že jste přišli. Máme jedinečnou možnost tady dnes seznámit se zkušenostmi se sociálním bydlením z Anglie a ze Skotska. Poslechneme si naše hosty, kteří se přímo účastnili přípravy zákona o sociálním bydlení ve Skotsku a poslechneme si zástupce armády z Pásy, která působí jako zprostředkovatel sociálního bydlení v Anglii. Já jsem velmi ráda, že náš seminář zaštítil pan ministr Jiří Dinsbír, který bohužel tu dneska z pracovních důvodů nemůže být. Ráda bych tu přivítala všechny zástupce a zástupkyně ministerstev a dalších institucí a organizací, které se podílí nebo nějakým způsobem působí na poli sociálního bydlení. Jmenovitě bych zde ráda přivítala zástupce veřejné ochránkyně, pra, veřejné ochránkyně práv pana Stanislava Křečka, který bohužel nás na chvíli musel opustit a odešel do Senátu. Také zde vítám pana náměstka pro místní rozvoj Petra, inženýra Petra Smrčka a paní náměstkyni na MSMPSV pro sociální začlenování paní Hanzlíkovou. Já se velice omlouvám, ale bohužel se poslední dobou trošku zadýchávám a momentálně to nemůžu nějakým způsobem ovlivnit, takže doufám, že se, to, že se to brzy srovná a nastavím správný hlas, který pro vás bude příjemnější, takže přijměte mou omluvu. A já bych předala slovo paní Martině Štěpánkové, ředitelce sekce pro lidská práva u pana, u pana ministra Jiřího Dinsbíra. Dobrý den, děkuji za slovo, děkuji za pozvání a dovolte mi, vážené dámy, vážení pánové, abych vás zde také přivítala, nejen tady jménem pana ministra pro lidská práva a rovné příležitosti a legislativu Jiřího Dinsbíra, ale také jménem jeho náměstkyně, paní Kateřiny Valechové, která, kteří, ti z vás, kteří znají, tak vědí, že tématika sociálního bydlení je, řekněme, její je jim takovou srdeční záležitostí, je to téma, kterému se věnuje velice dlouho, celou řadu let. Bohužel je společně s panem ministrem dnes na jednání v poslanecké sněmovně, takže se nemohla toho jednání účastnit, ale bude zcela jistě potom zvědavá na výsledky toho dnešního jednání. My jsme se zde dnes sešli na semináři s názvem Zkušenosti s přípravou a implementací koncepce, koncepce sociálního bydlení ze Skotska a Anglie, inspirace pro Českou republiku s otazníkem. Já věřím, že inspirace pro Českou republiku ten dnešní seminář zcela jistě bude. Ti, kteří z vás zde jsou z České republiky, tak zcela jistě vědí a pro hosty to vlastně sdělím tu informaci. Téma sociálního bydlení je téma, o kterém se více či méně mluví možná 10, možná 15 let v České republice. Dosud se v podstatě žádné vládě nepodařilo to téma nejen vyřešit, ale v podstatě ani nějakým způsobem uchopit. Ta vlastně stávající vláda, stejně jako pan ministr pro lidská práva, si téma sociálního bydlení dali jako vlastně prioritu, které by se chtěli v tom svém období věnovat. Z tohoto důvodu byla také vlastně schválena vládou, nebo byl schválen vládou úkol, který byl uložen Ministerstvu práce a sociálních věcí právě společně s ministrem pro lidská práva a s ministr, ministriní pro místní rozvoj zpracovat zákon o sociálním bydlení. Nejprve tedy jeho věcný záměr, který by měl v podstatě stanovit základní teze, na kterých ten zákon bude postaven což si myslím, že bude ta nejtěžší část, která nás bude čekat vůbec nastavit ty parametry, jak by to sociální bydlení mělo vypadat a následně bude přijat nebo bude zpracováno znění paragrafové, které 
podle mého tedy osobního názoru budou-li vlastně známy ty výchozí koncepty, tak už potom bude mnohem jednodušší zpracovat. Z uvedeného důvodu byla také ministrinní práce sociálních věcí vytvořena pracovní skupina, která je velice široce pojata. Je v ní, kromě tedy zástupců státní zprávy, byli do ní přizváni také zástupci neziskového sektoru, zástupci obcí, různých dalších svazů, zástupci akademické sféry. Takže se jedná o velice širokou platformu která by se měla tady následně dělit do menších pracovních skupin, skupiny, které již tady budou vlastně připravovat a konat tu samotnou tvůrčí, tvůrčí činnost. Já věřím, že se ten záměr podaří skutečně zrealizovat, že ta pracovní skupina bude, bude skutečně funkční a efektivní. Přestože teprve ta pracovní skupina začíná, tak si asi dovolím říct si dva základní principy, na kterých by ten návrh měl stát a které tedy si dovolím spíše říci za ministra, za ministra pro lidská práva. To je, prvním z těch principů je vlastně téma nebo princip, že sociální bydlení by mělo být nebo musí být realizováno v bytech, nikoli v ubytovnách, což je téma, o kterém se v poslední době také poměrně často hovořilo, ale ministr pro lidská práva je přesvědčen, že sociální bydlení musí být Bytek. Samozřejmě nás bude čekat velká diskuse o tom, jak by takový standardizovaný byt, nebo co by měl splňovat, jak by měl vypadat a tak dále. Ale v tomto směru asi to je základní teze. No a druhá teze, která je samozřejmě neméně důležitá, je vlastně princip, že ta, to sociální bydlení může být realizováno pouze ve velmi úzké spolupráci se samozprávami, s obcemi protože bez nich v podstatě v praxi není možné to, to téma sociální bydlení a vůbec sociální bydlení jako takové realizovat a provozovat. Na druhou stranu je, když se řekne A, je třeba říci i B, je samozřejmě potřeba vytvořit obcím pro toto podmínky, aby, toto, aby tuto svoji určitou povinnost mohli realizovat řádně, nedat jim pouze povinnost, ale zároveň tedy vytvořit podmínky. A v tom si myslím, že možná bude ten nejtěžší úkol, který bude tu pracovní skupinu čekat. Takže to je jenom takové stručné představení. Na závěr bych chtěla říci, že právo na bydlení je základní lidskou potřebou a naplnění tohoto práva, práva člověka bydlet, je vlastně nezbytné k tomu, aby mohl realizovat své potřeby další. Takže věřím, že tato vláda bude tou vládou, která to, tento svůj záměr na rozdíl od těch předešlých dotáhne do svého cíle. Bude ji čekat dlouhá cesta, bude, bude lehká, ale já věřím, že společně i s vámi se nám to podaří a že řekněme od roku 2016-2017 asi se shodneme, že není možné tu věc uspěchat, zároveň není možné příliš dlouho čekat, tak budeme se bavit již nad konkrétním návrhem, který třeba bude již v legislativním procesu a nebo bude schválen a my už budeme diskutovat o tom, o tom, jak ten zákon uvést v život. Takže já vám přeju, aby ten dnešní seminář byl pro vás přínosný, já věřím, že bude a abyste se zde dozvěděli nějaké nové teze a zkušenosti, které i my třeba budeme právě v těch pracovních skupinách při přípravě toho českého návrhu využít. Přeji vám tady hezký den. Tak já děkuji paní Martině Štěpánkové, jsem velmi ráda a myslím, že i my všichni, že téma sociálního bydlení se konečně, alespoň to tak zatím vypadá, stává prioritou. Jsem i ráda, že zde zaznělo, že sociální bydlení by mělo být postaveno především na bytech a děkuji i za ta slova o právu na bydlení, protože po těch dlouhých letech 
je to v našem českém kontextu opravdu novinka a řada neziskových organizací z různých oblastí, ať jsou to lidé se zdravotním handicapem nebo to jsou rodiny s dětmi, tak všechny neziskové organizace vědí, že to bydlení je základem pro rozvoj všech dalších schopností, dovedností a pro důstojný život. Takže jsem moc ráda, že to zaznělo a doufám, že meziresortní, meziresortní skupina k tématu sociálního bydlení s tímto tématem bude pracovat právě takto a bude mít na paměti cíle takové, které mají mít pozitivní dopad na lidi, na ty, kteří mají důstojně bydlet. Já jsem zapomněla bohužel říct, že dnešní seminář pořádá ve, spoluprát, ve spolupráci Agentura pro sociální začlenování, Armáda z pásy a Platforma pro sociální bydlení. Ještě než předám slovo těm důležitějším, než jsem já, tak bych zmínila pár organizačních věcí. Překlad, protože nás čeká anglická část, tak pro ty, kteří si netroufnou na angličtinu, je překlad na kanále číslo jedna. Toalety, pokud budete potřebovat, tak jsou dámské tady po levé straně, když vyjdete ze, ze sálu, páni to mají trochu složitější a je tam chod těmito dveřmi, takže ještě než začneme, raději předám tyto důležité, důležité informace. Martina Štěpánková řekla, že dnešní seminář má na konci otazník. Ten otazník tam není proto, že bychom se ptali, jestli, jestli je to inspirace. My věříme, že to inspirací je skotská zkušenost i anglická zkušenost, ale samozřejmě je jasné, že, ty, že jakékoliv zahraniční modely nemůžeme přijmout bez zbytku a je nutné aplikovat je na českou situaci. Nicméně není třeba vymýšlet nějaké úplně nové modely, když v jiných zemích s obdobným nebo někdy i trošku odlišným kulturním a sociálním kontextem už tu věc vymysleli, vědí, co funguje a co pro nás může být velmi cené, že vědí i co nefunguje a co se u nich neosvědčilo. A abych už přestala mluvit já, pozvala bych k nám, k nám do panelu pana Robert, Roberta Aldridge, který je vlastně přímým, je člověkem, který se podílel na vzniku skotského modelu sociální politiky, který působil v komisi, která tuto politiku připravovala a je zároveň zastupitelem města Edinburgh, takže má i ty zkušenosti z té obecní úrovně, už tady nezaznělo, ty obce budou jedním z velmi důležitých aktérů, který bude mít dopad na úspěšnost aplikace námi vymyšleného modelu sociálního bydlení. Thank you very much for the invitation here uh, today. Uh, as uh, the moderator has said, uh, I have two roles in my life. Uh, one, I am the chief executive of uh, a homelessness organisation, which is the umbrella body for all homelessness services in Scotland. And my other role is that I sit as a member of the municipality in Edinburgh, an elected member of the municipality of Edinburgh. And uh, I, think, uh, I think the reason I'm here is to uh, share the example of how we developed uh, what has been described as a world-leading approach to homelessness in Scotland. Uh, over the last 15 years, and I hope that perhaps some of the, the methods we used might be transferable to your own work in developing an approach to social housing. So, uh, just to uh, give a little bit of context about Scotland, um, as part of the United Kingdom, it has just under 5.5 million people. Uh, the 30% of the housing is what we term social housing. Now that is housing which is either owned by municipalities or by housing associations or run by cooperatives. That, that's my I, I, I know that terminology social housing can be, be used in different ways. Uh, for a population of 5.5 million we have just 32 uh, municipalities. 
uh, compared to I think it's six thousand uh, here. Uh, so our, our I, I think one of the things that was quite uh, more simple for us was that we could get one representative from each municipality into one room uh, in order to uh, uh, discuss things. Okay, um, if I can describe very briefly the situation uh, regarding homelessness before we developed our new policy. Um, there were around 45,000 households every year who uh, applied for help because they said they were uh, uh, homeless. And the homelessness legislation across the United Kingdom had existed since 1977. And before you were entitled to any ins uh, 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 assistance, and it was the local authority, the municipality, which had to uh, provide that assistance, you had to overcome four hurdles, as we like to call them. The first one was you had to be homeless under the defi legal definition. Once you were homeless, that wasn't the end of the story. Uh, you had to also prove that you had an additional need, that you were in priority need. And I'll describe that uh, a little later on. If you passed that second test, there was then a third test, which is, did you deliberately do something to make yourself homeless? Uh, and that might be, if you, if you knew that you would become homeless by destroying your apartment, then uh, you could fall at that hurdle, for example. But if you passed those three hurdles that you were uh, homeless, you were, you had some additional need, and you were not deliberately homeless, there was then a fourth thing which is, okay, the local authority might have a duty to house you unless they could prove that you had a connection with another local authority, in which case they could pass the responsibility to the, the, the area where you had a local connection. Um, just to describe priority need, it was primarily families with children, older people, people with mental health or f physical health problems, people with learning disabilities, and there was a fifth uh, uh, grouping which was people who were otherwise quite vulnerable. It was quite a, a, a broad category. But it was essentially a system where people were rationed out of being helped. It was a system to say, to kind of fail people at every hurdle, so more and more people were filtered out. In 1999, there was a new Scottish Parliament which was set up, which had powers over all domestic legislation. Uh, it took a new approach to making policy, which was trying to be as consensual as possible. And there was a, a strong political desire, since this was a new parliament, for it to do something which proved that Scotland could do something differently and better than our neighbours in England. Uh, and uh, it was felt that we could do this best in so social policy. So there was a, a strong political uh, uh, buy-in to, to having an achievement. And it so happened that all of the housing interests had prepared for this, so uh, homelessness NGOs, the Professional Institute of Housing, uh, the Federation of Housing Associations, the local authority uh, uh, representative groups, uh, academics, we had all prepared ourselves for this and had a common view that we could do something significant to tackle homelessness in Scotland. Um, the minister was impressed. We were, we were put into a room and the minister said, what do you want? Which is very refreshing, I think. Um, and we, we, told, we told her what we didn't want. And she said, I know that, but what do you actually want? Which was much more difficult. Um, but she, she bought into the idea and set up a task force, a short life task force. And uh, the, the minister chaired the task force. It had a a, a, a specific uh, length of time that was only going to be in existence for two years um, to, to come up with proposals to deal with homelessness. That represented on that task force was the minister in the chair, uh, the head of the housing division of the civil service, um, 
the National Housing Agency at the time, there were two representatives from municipalities. One, uh, a, a person in charge of a housing department in one of the main cities, but the other, an elected representative, because it was felt important to have both sides, both the officials and the elected representatives involved. Uh, there was the Housing Association Federation, three home, national homelessness NGOs, uh, including myself, <laughs> I sat on that, um, and a, a, a professor who specialised in uh, uh, housing law. In addition, uh, the editor of the street newspaper, a representative from social services so that it was not just housing, and a representative from health. At that point, it was decided not to include a homeless person because it was felt unfair to put the burden of representing the experiences of all homeless people on one homeless person. And so homeless people were consulted throughout the process of the development uh, of, 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 of the proposals. The task force met every month. Um, the minister could not chair all of them, uh, but the head of the civil service division chaired the ones that she could not be at. Um, there was a small administrative team in the civil service which uh, helped. Uh, three people, three civil servants, who prepared the meetings and did the background papers. And there was some financial support to the group, primarily for commissioning academic research. To, back, uh, to prepare the way. Uh, but there was also some assistance to uh, the 32 individual municipalities to do certain work to prepare for implementation. A lot of the organisations did some work themselves uh, behind the scenes pro bono because it was in their interest to make this work. Okay. Research played a very important role a lot, a lot of organisations had undertaken grey research surveys and so on, but it was felt we needed to be very clear in developing uh, this new policy, that it was going to be based on the most robust information possible. So, uh, uh, with the help of the professor who was on the group, it, we uh, commissioned 13 pieces of uh, proper academic research to supplement the grey research, the surveys and so on, which had been done by uh, other uh, organisations. Um, looking at three main themes, first of all, what did we actually know? Because there's a whole lot of research happens and nobody gathers together what we actually know. So it's, let's, let's bring together what we know and identify what the gaps are. Secondly, um, what is it that we don't understand? And we felt we understood a lot about why people become homeless, but we didn't know a lot about how they stop being homeless. What are the effective ways of stopping people being homeless? We're helping them out of it, for example. And the third element was looking at what, what works, what is effective? Um, uh, and so 13 pieces of research were commissioned, and that was a, a reasonably substantial piece of money, but within a very short time frame. So the task force came out with 59 recommendations. Only three of them were re related to legislation. The others were all related to the other elements relating to uh, a change in the culture in the approach to homelessness. Um, we made a, a very clear decision, we had a lot of argument, that we would not, when we were drawing up the, the recommendations, come to an agreement about a form of words which disguised a difference of opinion, but we would actually argue out and be quite clear about what the conclusion was. That was a difficult argument, but, it, but it's made a big difference that we were actually very clear and didn't leave uh, matters ambiguous. Um, and we're clear, the clear principle that there would be a safety net for everybody. Uh, there would be um, a right for every a homeless person who was not intentionally homeless to be housed by the municipality. The municipality could find them housing, not necessarily, not necessarily housing them in their own uh, 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 um, housing. 
But it was also recognition that it's about more than housing, so it's, there were, that's why the health representative, the social services representative, and so on, were also involved. There were two pieces of legislation. The first one uh, gave a right to every homeless person to get temporary accommodation when they applied for assistance. This was a huge difference because most single people had been turned away. Uh, they'd fallen at the, if you remember back to the four hurdles, the hurdle about being in priority need, they failed at that and were just uh, given a list of uh, uh, bed and breakfast hotels and hostels to, to, to go to. So a duty now went to every homeless person. And we didn't trust the minister, <laughs> to be quite honest. We didn't trust that the minister would uh, implement the more radical proposals. So we were very keen to have this one thing which gave a right to everybody implemented as quickly as possible, plus a duty for municipalities to draw up a strategy to bring together all of the actors who were necessary in their area to draw up a strategy to prevent homelessness and find solutions. The second, the second piece of legislation which did happen, to, to our surprise, uh, um, brought in this new right to permanent accommodation for all unintentionally homeless households. Okay. The vision uh, that the minister, of a very, I, I think the, the, uh, the term would be a very brave minister, um, gave in 2002 was that in 10 years time we can look forward to a Scotland in which every homeless person has a basic right to somewhere decent to live and receives all of the appropriate support and health care they need to, to sustain it. So the very bold vision and everybody said you're a very brave minister but um, the the important thing was that in our legislation we gave ourselves 10 years to achieve it. You cannot achieve these things overnight and we made it, it realistic. So how did, we, um, how did we enact this vision? Well, it was basically about changing a culture. Um, a lot of energy was spent in municipalities going through the bureaucratic process of rationing people out of being helped. Uh, the, the, the change in the culture was going, do you fit the criteria to a new culture which said, how can we help you? Uh, and, and that meant a change not only in the municipality, it, it freed up a lot of the energies of uh, staff within the municipality to do something positive, change their, 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 their jobs to be much more positive uh, rather than negative. But it also meant that all the other actors had to change their culture as well. So it was no longer uh, appropriate to simply manage people within homelessness. It was about trying to end their homelessness. Okay. Um, so that meant legislation, yes. The regulation and monitoring, yes. Um, partnership amongst all of the, uh, uh, the, the, the groups who were affected, uh, different landlords, different services for homeless people, health services and so on. And recognising, as I said before, that this is about more than simply a house. It's about the, the, the much broader thing. So the plan was, we give ourselves a 10 year implementation period because it takes a long time to change culture and to understand the full implications of such a radical change. But importantly, we had the date for full implementation in the legislation. So it was 2012 was in the legislation. And that was important because governments change. <laughs> and uh, the re 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 relative uh, commitment of a, a, a government might change. But if there's a date by which something has to be implemented, then they all are, are committed to it. So it made, it made sure that it remained a high uh, priority. Um, the change in culture was, as I said, moving to how can we help you, but it was also about looking for long-term solutions rather than simply putting someone in a hostel and they may come back again in five months uh, when, when things have broken down. It's about finding long-term solutions and a focus on preventing people becoming homeless in the first place. So it's 
thinking around the issue, not focusing on the crisis point. <coughs> and all stakeholders had to change. The local authorities, the municipalities, were the focus for the change. Um, so they had to develop a homelessness strategy. They had to bring together all of the relevant partners uh, and all agree about how best to approach preventing homelessness and finding long-term solutions. They also had to ensure that there was temporary accommodation for everybody who applied as homeless. They, th there's a new piece of legislation which was enacted just last year where now, there's now a legal duty that they have to assess what additional support needs a homeless household hope might uh, have and to make sure those support needs are also supplied. So that's about, again, making sure that a solution lasts uh, for the long term rather than being simply a quick fix. Um, and of course, needing to ensure that there's the permanent accommodation for homeless households who, are, who have not deliberately made themselves homeless. And that required planning over a 10 year period to make sure accommodation was available. At the same time there were duties on other uh, uh, organisations, the health minister issued uh, a directive to health authorities that they had to develop a health and homelessness action plan. They had to understand the health needs of homeless people in their area and they had to link with the municipalities and integrate their health plans with the homelessness strategy. Um, and Housing associations who operate uh, as relatively independent, there was a legal duty on them to assist local authorities in their homelessness duties if they were asked to do so. So that was quite a, quite a wide-ranging change. Importantly, to ensure this happened, there was monitoring and regulation. And, uh, an independent Scottish housing regulator was developed, like, almost like an ombudsman service, um, but with, with powers who inspected the homelessness services of every municipality uh, and could require them to develop improvement <coughs> plans and could re-inspect after a length of time to ensure those improvement plans were, were, were being implemented. Um, the regulator also regulates the performance of housing associations, so uh, it made sure that the housing associations were playing their role in assisting in, in this framework. At national level, um, the <coughs> minister had to make regular, it was part of the legislation, I think, I think it was I think quite well drafted, that the Minister had to make regular reports to the Scottish Parliament on progress to all, towards the end date of 2012. And parliamentary committees would inquire into specific aspects to make sure everything was, was on track. Uh, there was also a, a national implementation group, monitoring group, and that included representatives of the different landlords, civil servants, but also NGOs and others with an interest, again to ensure that progress was being made and to identify areas where additional support might be needed to make sure everybody was on track for the end date. And within the health service there was a monitoring of the health and, homeless, health and homelessness standards which were, were brought in. Okay. We had to know whether this whole uh, policy was successful or not. And we had very long discussions about what, what a measure of success might be. I mean, would it be simply that the numbers of homeless people fell? And we said, well, no, because uh, if, if you, you can engineer a reduction in numbers of homeless people by turning people away. Um, so we recognised that if you improve a policy, then more people will come forward. The people who used to stay away because they knew they would get no help would come forward. So we recognised in our first one, uh, in, in one of them, that uh, homelessness becomes more visible 
that there would be an increase in numbers presenting as homeless. And we all agreed that we would not attack the minister for an increase in numbers because it was an inevitable consequence of the change in policy. But, it, but there were four other measures which had to be looked at together with that, which was that nobody needs to sleep on the street. That doesn't mean nobody does sleep on the street. It means that nobody has to. There are sufficient places for them. That when people that reintegration into a, a society is long term and sustainable, and that we measured that through the number of people who came back as homeless, repeating a presentation as homeless. Um, that fewer people should become homeless in the first place. That measure of how well we were preventing homelessness, and that the time people spent in the crisis of homelessness should be smaller. So the duration of homelessness should be um, uh, reduced. Okay, I, I have three or four slides about what happened with that. But uh, I suppose I'll, I'll whisk through those very quickly to leave some time for questions. But basically, the numbers of rough sleeping have fallen quite dramatically during the implementation of this. Um, when the, the initial new legislation came in, and I think it's the, there's one, there's a slide with a, a graph on it. You don't need to look at the detail of that, other than it goes along quite flat, it then goes up. That's when the new, the new le uh, legislation came in, and then it begins to level off, and it's now fallen again. And in the last two years, homelessness levels have fallen by 12% and 10%. Uh, uh, so, at the same time as in England, homelessness levels have been rising. Uh, as for sustainable resettlement, it's simply that the numbers uh, doing repeat presentations keep falling. Uh, and, um, as I mentioned, there's been a 12% a, a followed by a 10% reduction in homelessness in the last two years. Okay, um, I want to just move to the very last slide, if I can now, um, to leave time for people to, to raise questions. And that was the, the kind of the key lessons that I think come from this. One is that, before I get to the, the, the points I put down there, I think one of the keys was that all of the relevant housing actors had prepared uh, well in advance and had found <coughs> something on which they could agree. I mean, for different reasons, you know, uh, a lot of the municipalities were interested in this because it was a good lever to uh, get finance from central government for housing. Um, uh, a lot of the NGOs were there because it was their purpose to reduce homelessness. People have different purposes, but if you can engineer a win-win uh, and get an agreed point of view, then I, it is of immense value to politicians to know that all of the actors are, are on the same side. The second lesson is basically that it does need to be the needed buy-in from the municipalities, from health and from central government. All of them needed to be committed to it and that takes a lot of work um, to make sure that happens but it also relies on political leadership. The, the next one, a date for the implementation of the new uh, 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 law in the legislation was absolutely crucial because when, when political priorities change, it could easily have fallen down the agenda or off the agenda completely. Because there was a date that uh, the minister was going to have to report to Parliament on whether this had been achieved or not, it focused resources and it focused attention. Um, I think we needed time to plan, to understand what the implications would be and to make preparations. And that's why a 10 year uh, uh, period before the implementation date was absolutely crucial. Um, the fourth thing is that it, it, it wasn't just about changing the rights of individuals. That was a, a, a good focus. But much more important was a change in culture towards 
towards the people that we're seeking to assist. And moving from a very bureaucratic approach and ticking boxes and saying, you deserve help, you don't, to going, everybody who's approaching us has got some need. How can we best meet that need? And that, that's a, a very big change, and I think it's become ingrained in the municipalities. And finally, um, although it's, the, the legislation is, is based on, on rights of individuals, um, it's much, or it, much more important than giving people a right when they have become homeless, is to prevent them becoming homeless in the first place. And we didn't spend enough time looking at prevention uh, initially as a homelessness task force. We're doing a lot more on that now. And uh, I, I would say that, you know, not focusing on the point of crisis, but on prevention and long-term solutions is the key. So thank you very much. I hope that's been of some help. Já také děkuji Robertu Altričovi, myslím, že si ta prezentace zaslouží trošku ohlas. Myslím, že tam pro nás je spousta věcí k inspiraci. Je tu i řada lidí, o kterých víme, že jsou součástí meziresortní mezi skupiny k tématu nového zákona o sociálním bydlení, ale také koncepce o sociálním bydlení, sociálního bydlení, což by měla být. Doufejme, ta komplexní dlouhodobá strategie, jako se jí podařilo připravit ve Skotsku. Za inspiraci doufám, že to pro nás bude i motivace trochu se přiblížit tomu komplexnímu způsobu řešení. A já bych už teď dala slovo vám, jestli máte nějaké dotazy nebo komentáře na pana Roberta Aldridge. Kolega, pokud někdo má zájem se zeptat nebo vznést nějaký komentář, přihlašte se a kolega vám dá mikrofon. Děkuji za zajímavý výklad a mám jednu otázku. V úvodu přetášející použil obrat bezdomovcem z vlastní vůle. Já bych se rád zeptal, jak se dívají, dívali na bezdomovce, který se jim stal vlastním zaviněním. Jakkoliv v sociální oblasti slovo vina nemáme rádi, ale nicméně jde mě o situace, kdy člověk ztratil bydlení, protože neplnil povinnosti s ním související, jako je placení nájemného, devastace bytů a podobně. Děkuji. OK, um, thanks for the question. I suppose two things uh, to say here. First is that the uh, definition of intentional homelessness is quite narrow. It is that you must have deliberately done something or failed to do something which resulted in your homelessness. So there has to be a conscious act. Uh, secondly, you need to be aware, needed to be aware that the consequence of doing that was likely to be homelessness. So if, for example, uh, it, it was a result of a psychotic episode or something like that, then that would not be intentional homelessness because it, it was not something you did knowing, knowing the consequences. And thirdly, that um, each, each individual case has to be examined on its merits. So you cannot have a, a certain circumstance where you know, somebody in uh, debt with their rent is automatically um, intentionally homeless. You have to look at the reasons why, and it had to be, has to be a deliberate act on, on their behalf. Okay, so that's the first part. The second part is what, what happens to people who, who are in that small group who are intentionally homeless. Uh, our, our legislation says that they uh, must be given advice and assistance in finding somewhere to stay. Um, so it, 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 it's not it's, it's not very strong. That's that's one of the gaps. When the full uh, uh, if and when the full legislation is implemented, there was a plan that uh, the municipality would have to give such a person a short tenancy uh, and identify the reasons for the finding of intentionality and provide support 
to deal with that problem. So if it was a problem with anger or behaviour, they would offer support to change the behaviour. If it's to do with financial mismanagement, they'd give support with finance. But so far, uh, it has been impossible to uh, find agreement with the muni <laughs> municipalities to, to, to deal with that, that particular aspect. So at the moment, advice and assistance. Nějaký další dotaz? Děkuji, dobrý den, Matěj Stepnický, místo starosta Prahy 3. Já bych se rád zeptal, prosím, na to, my máme jako obec, nebo já usiluju prosazení koncepce podporovaného bydlení v rozptýleném bytovém fondu a obec si vlastně uchovala volné byty v domech, které jinak privatizovala a jsou to dneska domy, které patří společenstvím vlastníků jednotek, to znamená vlastníkům jednotlivých bytových jednotek. A mě by zajímalo, na které kulturní stereotypy jste naráželi při prosazování té koncepce sociálního bydlení, protože se samozřejmě setkáváme s určitým odporem vlastníků těch bytových jednotek, kteří si je koupili za určité finanční obnosy a domnívají se, že to považuji za kulturní stereotyp, ale taky trochu tržní realitu. Domnívají se, že cena jejich nemovitostí samozřejmě klesá tím, že v, nich, v těch domech obec vlastně provozuje nebo provozovala by nějaké sociální nebo podporované bydlení, čili na jaké kulturní stereotypy jste prosím narazil vy při zavádění sociálního bydlení ve Skotsku a jakým způsobem jste se s nimi vypořádávali? Já poprosím ještě o druhý dotaz, který paní Jeslouža. Dobrý den, se jmenu Marcela Spělová, z Amalis Pásy z Ostravy. A můj takový dotaz je, zda se setkali se situací, kdy ten člověk bez domova měl dluhy u všech možných, ať soukromých nebo státních institucí, které poskytují bydlení. Co s tím potom dělali? Okay, uh, two, qu two different questions, but both big questions. Um, as far as supported housing is concerned, uh, I, we, we, we didn't manage it uh, as well as we could have. One, one of the discussions we had was about uh, developing a public awareness campaign alongside uh, the homelessness legislation. To, to help people to understand that people become homeless because of things like relationship breakdown or unexpected events in their lives. Uh, and they're not a separate species. They're, they're, they're their sons, daughters, nephews, nieces, uh, and so on. So we, I, I, I think we should have done a better public awareness campaign. But I think the way that you, um, that well, two ways in which it's managed. One is uh, that it is national legislation and there is national legislation uh, on a framework of who gets priority for social housing. So in very broad terms, it includes homeless people, people with large families, um, uh, people with health problems and so on. Um, uh, and so in a sense, the, those who were allocating the houses could point to it being something slightly beyond their control, so that, that, that helps. But the, the other element, is, which is far more important, is reassuring the neighbours by putting the appropriate support in place for people who have extra needs and, 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 and explaining to them that there's additional support there and that if there's a problem, the housing uh, uh, department will, will assist in dealing with any problems. And, and people are usually more afraid of what might happen than what actually happens. And um, it, it, in reality, so long as the support is there, people usually become quite accustomed to uh, good neighbours developing. Uh, as far as debts and multiple debts are concerned, um, it is important, we, we think, that people have good financial advice and that uh, you know, there, are, there are initiatives. If somebody is so far in debt that they cannot see a way out of it, there are ways of dealing with it, for example, by becoming bankrupt. That's quite a, a, a 
be a dramatic thing to do, but there are other ways as well. But we also have advice agencies who will help them to negotiate um, a repayment plan of their debts, bring them all together and agreeing with the major companies that they owe money to what is an amount that person can afford to pay towards that debt. And, and when they engage with that, if they, they pay regularly for a period, then uh, the, the, uh, the paper is wiped clean and they can uh, gain access to accommodation. Já bych dala ještě prostor pro poslední dva dotazy z publika, komentáře. Ještě někdo bude mít zájem? Dobrý den, já jsem Štěpán Duka z Platformy pro sociální bydlení. S panem Hodrejčem jsme se také bavili o tématu, které vlastně do velké míry podnítilo tu veřejnou diskuzi o sociálním bydlení a které pravděpodobně bude třeba řešit ještě předtím, než bude mít dostatek sociálních bytů a zákon o sociálním bydlení a koncepci. A to jsou ubytovny a vlastně celkově jakoby špatný management těch ubytoven nebo ubytování hotelového typu. Rád bych se zeptal, jak řeší ve Skotsku situace, kdy je třeba nezodpovědný majitel ubytovny nebo velkého komplexu bytu, který se nestará dobře o své nájemníky, neopravuje nemovitost a podobně. Děkuji. A já poprosím ještě o ten druhý dotaz. My jsme Think uh, your concept um, might um, appear to some politicians in this country to be a comeback of communism. That means that you want to help people who do not deserve this help. And in Czech language, a very popular word is "nepřizpůsobivý," uh, supposedly unadaptable, or you would translate it as asocial, or as you would say, not deserving. So um, that was the question before. Now I want to ask, what would you suggest for such kind of category of people who uh, actually, whose fault it was not to commit, uh, fulfill their commitments and who is going to pay their rent in a place where the municipality is guaranteeing housing for them? Is it the municipality paying the rent or the former homeless person itself? Thank you very much. Okay, um, the first question first. Uh, we have a situation concerning private uh, landlords uh, where if they have accommodation which is occupied by more than one family, so it's called a house in multiple occupation, um, then they must uh, have a license which is issued by the municipality. And the license depends on two main aspects. One is that the property is technically of a high standard or a reasonable standard, and that includes you know, gas safety, wind and water tight, uh, electrical safety, um, fire safety issues and so on. Uh, and the second aspect is, is the manager, and the, the, the legal terminology is a fit and proper person. And that really is designed to stop people who are in organized crime or who have convictions for assault or sexual assault uh, on, on tenants or whatever, that, uh, from becoming managers. And the license can be refused on either or both of those grounds. Um, it is illegal for somebody to accept rent if they do not have a license for, in, for a house multiple occupation in Scotland. Um, so that's, that, 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 that's quite powerful. Um, it, in, in effect, oh, I will argue against myself, um, 
I'm sure people will know that organised crime is very clever um, and operates uh, 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 always one step ahead of the law. And those that are involved in organised crime will often find people to manage the property who do not have any convictions who act on their behalf. So it, it's, not, it's not perfect, but it is at least one, one tool. As far as the, uh, the, 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 it's actually a very small minority of people who are completely antisocial and, and asocial. There are two things. One is uh, we have tried to move away from the concept of people who are deserving of help and people who are not deserving of help to people who need help. Um, it's one based on needs. Um, but um, those who are who have particular difficulties, and it's not it's not simply homeless people. Um, it depends on the difficulty. Some of them can be assisted to change behaviour. Some may not. And for the very very small minority whose whose behaviour cannot be changed, they uh, in Scotland uh, they simply get given advice and assistance on how to look for somewhere to be to to stay. That, that's, that's the limit of the duty towards them. But I think the, but the numbers are, that fall into that category are very, very small. Um, I, I think in Glasgow city, an industrial city of about one million population, I would say maybe 20 to 30 people maximum fall into that category. Ještě bych chtěla Roberta Aldridge požádat o stručnou reakci na jeden můj dotaz nebo žádost o upřesnění. Hodně se hovořilo v prezentaci o lidech bezdomova. V České republice ten termín je vnímán velmi úzce jako lidi bez přístřeší. Já bych Roberta ještě chtěla požádat, jestli by mohl říct, jak vlastně člověk bezdomova nebo bezdomovec je vnímán ve Skotsku. Okay, we, we, we have chosen a very broad definition of homelessness. It includes, for example, people who are threatened with becoming homeless within two months if their landlord has issued an eviction notice and within two months they will become homeless, they, they're affected. It's people, uh, for example, women within uh, uh, refuges uh, for uh, domestic violence are homeless. Uh, People in hostels where they don't have uh, are, are are regarded as homeless, um, as well as people who have become homeless from flood, fire, disaster, uh, and uh, it's also uh, somebody who who has a, a home, but it is unreasonable for them to continue to occupy it. So they might be at risk of violence if they go back there, or. Uh, uh, um, or it might be in such a poor condition that it is dangerous for them to stay there. And also, a further one is if you're living in um, accommodation which is both overcrowded and because of that a danger to your health. So, quite, quite a broad definition. Já děkuji Robertovi Aldridgeovi a už bych k nám pozvala uh, naše další dva hosty, tentokrát z Anglie, zástupce Salvation Army Housing Association, pana, pana Nigela Perinkna, výkonného ředitele této organizace, a pana Petra Leitna.